Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We are talking about IT modernization, just laid out a sort of a state of the state of a wide swath of activities going on across these various uh, agencies. I'm going to go back to you, Sol Denise, and uh, ask you to highlight a specific program that you would like to focus on. Sure. Thanks, Luke. Uh, so I, I mentioned this briefly uh, earlier. Uh, one of the things that we're really excited about, and this is not just from an IT or CIO perspective, but also from a product owner partnership perspective um, and mission, our operators, a lot of excitement behind the first ever DHS intelligence mobile app. Um, during the pandemic, it really caused us to think outside the box in terms of uh, sharing our intelligence data. Most of our work is done on the classified uh, fabrics. Uh, so we had to really shift uh, and we were able to do that with the technology that our department CIO provides to us on the unclassified side. But that also got us thinking, uh, how can we change the user experience in terms of the unclassified side and how we most efficiently and effectively share timely intelligence with our state and local tribal, territorial and private sector partners. So we had a vision. Uh, we wanted to develop a mobile uh, app a solution for our partners. Uh, we wanted to change that user experience and uh, do intelligence sharing a little bit differently from the way that we've been doing it for the past 15 plus years. Mm -hmm. So we actually, um, this was a good example of uh, unity of effort and the power of partnering. We actually partnered with our uh, department CIO team and we uh, partnered with our mission as well uh, to come up with exactly what was needed from a user mission perspective uh, that enabled us to develop the first mobile app for INA. So that's been a really, really exciting project that we've been working on. Um, it also, like I said, highlights the power of partnering uh, and changes our user experience, uh, not, not just within the department's intelligence enterprise, or with within the the intelligence analysts that are that are federal employees of the Office of Intelligence and Analysis, but it changes the experience for our customers, our partners at the state, local, tribal, territorial, and private sector, uh, and really works to change that user experience and strengthen our ability to share timely intelligence. Fantastic use case. And, and again, I just have to highlight that, that, that broad swath of user base that you have to account for there. Hard enough to just keep it inside the bubble in the IC, if you will, on the high side, just to bring that all the way down to the private sector. Incredible uh, uh, capability, uh, no doubt, with, uh, with the mobile technology. So thank you very much for that. Nick, how about at Pure Storage? I know there's a lot of activity going on. You're striped across so many of these agencies. Give us an example of a program you'd like to highlight uh, and, and raise awareness to for the listening audience. Sure thing, Luke. Uh, we have been very, very fortunate uh, to support all of the agencies on this call, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And what we have been uh, successful in helping to do is understanding the vision for the transformation and the path to the future and providing the fundamental underlying capabilities to deliver that in a novel um, cost model. So acquiring technology is easy. You spend a lot of money, it gets deployed into your data center, rinse and repeat every three to five years. And it's a cycle that will break the budgets of most organizations. It's also problematic from the perspective of what you, <laughs> what you spec three years ago that you finally acquire three years later is oftentimes from our perspective, an obsolete piece of equipment. Uh, 18 months later, you get that deployed on your data center floor, and lo and behold, it's obsolete now too. And this endless cycle of continuing technical debt has been breaking the backs of government agencies. So in addition to being able to deliver cutting edge technology, being able to sustain it and carry it forward and modernize it in place non-disruptively at a flat fixed cost has fundamentally changed how our customers are able to acquire, deploy, and then sustain at a predictable cost basis in perpetuity. And the short version is the technology gets better, the agency capacity gets bigger, but the cost basis doesn't increase over time. And that's 
that's been incredibly effective and successful. But the, the secondary piece of that is the technology is an enabler for greater capacity and better security. So modernized systems start to have a lot of inherent security capability and data protection capability built in, but they also provide better connectivity to new and evolving IT architectures, applications, application baselines, um, things like DevSecOps and Kubernetes are fundamentally different than our legacy technologies, but the underlying infrastructure needs to be able to provide the adaptation of new and emerging technologies. So these are all the reasons why we've been tremendously proud to be chosen to support these agencies by giving them the ability and the assurance that whatever they want to do in the future is already inherently in the system or will be in the system and implemented without any disruption or without any increasing cost. Almost a reference to Moore's law there and in, uh, in the ability to collect, retrieve, store, secure data and share it and make it available. Interesting uh, and very important. Nancy, uh, it is tax season and uh, there's a lot of stuff going on over there. I know you're, you're continue to modernize. You've got such a massive uh, user population that you're dealing with. Give us an example. You top line some of these programs you're working on. Give us an example of one, maybe you can go a little bit deeper on a program you'd like to highlight. I first want to share that you know one of the biggest transformations within the Internal Revenue Service is is not about getting to modernization. It's about being a modernization a modernized shop and how we work. And we've had lots of pro program examples. I'll give you a few in a minute. But for me, the greatest success in modernization is driving our our culture to a culture of being modernized. We've talked previously in the program about the plumbing. That is not exciting, right? Um, but as a CIO, some of our greatest challenges are to have a current plumbing, a strong foundation, so that we can churn out the services. You know, the IRS IT shop, as you said, Luke, is, is big. It's moving fast. We make change happen. And we're, you know, in the public eye to support the country. And talking to my CIO peers across government, so many of us share the feeling that the pandemic, again, has underscored the importance of modernization. Um, we've made a lot of progress focusing on strong foundations. We focused on resiliency to ensure that our systems are available when our customers need them. We've improved our customer experience through our toll-free lines that I talked about before. Um, we've become an agile shop and delivered new websites and new online services in less than three months, like we did last year with the Advanced Child Tax Credit in a multilingual online and mobile fashion. Um, there's such a misconception around information technology at the IRS being dated. Uh, you all, you probably see the headlines about Kennedy's error technology. You know, like all big IT shops, we have legacy systems that we're maintaining and where funding permits, we modernize them. While the agency was on the cutting edge in the 60s, or so I'm told, uh, with the adoption of automated data processing and the development of the IMF, we've been accused of being stuck in that era for a long time. Um, I have the pleasure occasionally of visiting our computing centers, mostly giving congressional delegations tours, and you'd be surprised at how modern our computing centers are. Um, and I'd love to come back in a couple of years and, and tell you that our computing centers have progressed even more with both on-prem and cloud foundations. A couple of years ago, we published our modernization plan and we outlined um, lots of initiatives uh, to improve the customer experience. And while we executed on that plan, often replanning um, with the funding that we received, we delivered a host of other upgrades and new experiences. So you know, what are we most proud of? The fact that we've been able to continue to um, deliver more services to our customers while building that strong foundation so that we can genuinely be agile and increase our velocity even before we're asked. Right, you gotta have that underlying capability so you can stack those things on top of it. And certainly 
IRS at the vanguard of modernization, you've been doing electronic filing for decades. Uh, so hats off to you and uh, in, a, in a very wide population. Going to go down to you, John. Uh, give us an example, uh, highlight a program that uh, you would like to raise awareness to the listening audience about uh, how you're enabling some of these capabilities to happen there at Verizon. Yeah, thanks, Luke. I, you know, there's so many examples, and uh, I, I, I'm going to go to plan B because Nancy talked a little bit about some of the contact center modernization that's happening in so many uh, different agencies, which is such a great example of how we're really transforming the customer experience with callbacks, with, you know, bots, with some of the uh, ability to now not have to get to an agent, not have to sit on hold for, you know, a number of minutes uh, to be able to get your issue resolved. So what a great example of, of how we're helping a lot of agencies modernize. But, you know, another one that I'll touch on that I think is, is close to everyone is during the pandemic, everyone has had a need to get to their healthcare providers, and we haven't always had the opportunity to get to them in a physical setting. And so really proud of the work that Verizon has been able to do with the VA in providing access to some of these services and technologies to veterans across the country. Uh, we've been working with the Office of Connected Care now for a number of years. We've provided solutions via a mobile connection, a tablet uh, device, uh, to allow veterans across the country to be able to access their provider uh, from the comfort of their own home. Uh, this is for regular visits, for checkups, and for sort of day-to-day -day, uh, activity. But it's also things that are really important in a pandemic, like suicide prevention or being able to connect with a counselor or just being able to connect with other veterans. Uh, so making sure that this experience is available, it's accessible, it's easy to use, and it's something that they can get, uh, can get access to on a regular basis is, is critically important. So the evolving uh, platform that we're, we're developing, the access to the technology, and then the uh, inevitable deployment of more and more services to rural America to get more and more veterans access to these services uh, has been critically important and something that we are very, very proud of. We're also working with the VA on innovating the future of healthcare. Uh, you may have read uh, about some of our work over the past year with uh, the VA, uh, places like Palo Alto and others, where we've built the first uh, 5G innovation lab inside mm -hmm. of the hospital. So working with partners like Medivis and Microsoft to really create new and innovative ways to, for doctors to take care of patients, uh, provide 3D and virtual reality imagery uh, to be able to, to really identify what's happening and how do we best treat a patient uh, as we go forward. So some things that you might think of as sort of future technologies that are being done today uh, and, and then basics like being able to visit your doctor in the home, a really, really incredible suite of solutions and things we're, uh, we're looking to uh, continue to provide to, uh, to veterans and others and really help modernize the, uh, the healthcare service and uh, customer experience in that, uh, that uh, sector. Customer experience being very key. We had VA on the other day. They said that uh, 60, 70% of the veterans say they absolutely want to maintain this virtual experience um, uh, in, the, uh, in these appointments. Jamie, uh, let's go over to you and talk about patent and trade. Give us an example of an area that you're uh, doing some, some, some modernization capability and enabling the, uh, the customer base. Well, I got to tell you, I love all the current answers because it's exactly along the same lines. But I will emphasize that the major, the most important and significant modernization is not in the tools. It's in the head. Mm -hmm. Because the whole cultural thing, it's a mindset. So one of the cliches that I have within the organization is mission first, but people always. And so we always talk about people, process, and tools. The most important component of that is people. Now, can you have great processes and great tools? Of course, and you should. But as I was taught in the U.S. Army, you fight with what you got, not with what you want to have. And you don't bet the farm on emerging technologies when you haven't proven them out. The reason they're emerging is because they're new. They're not scalable yet. You haven't gone through the experience. Not to say that you can't scale up quickly if you find great benefit. And that seems to be the bureaucratic problem, the sense of urgency to get something out into the field, into the hands of people so that we can figure out how to scale. One of the greatest success stories in our modern battlefield was the ability to give technology to our lieutenants and captains in the field, in the desert, and then show how those uh, inner information technology data sharing could actually help the battlefield and take advantage of different opportunities that people couldn't see before. In that same light, we are using 
artificial intelligence and really machine learning from big data analytics, training algorithms as an augmentation tool for our examiners. In other words, we're not letting the machines guide us. We are guiding the machines. And in this machine learning, we've been able to augment individual tools for individual examiners, and that's out there. So it's the people first mentality of what does it really require? What tools do they need to make them more effective, more optimizing it across? Of course, we're going to go for cheap, better, cheaper, and faster. But at the same time, it has to be around that person. Mission first, people always. Back to you, Luke. Absolutely. And a, a very good way to highlight the, uh, the sort of the people, the culture part of this, if you will. Nicholas, let's talk about uh, at Snowflake and give us an example of a program you'd like to highlight uh, that you're enabling this ecosystem. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Uh, I've got dozens, but I'll focus on one that I think is probably one of the coolest. Um, fraud, waste and abuse is a massive problem in the in the federal government across Absolutely. every agency, every vertical. Everybody has to be conscious of it, look out for it and, and handle it in the best way possible. And uh, healthcare is no exception to that that vertical. Um, we've had a couple of customers over the years, large healthcare providers that want to eliminate as much fraud, waste and abuse in their billing systems as they possibly can. And the world's largest healthcare provider is now on board as a Snowflake customer doing exactly that. And But what's cool about it, it's not necessarily that it's done, it's how it's done. In the past, you would have something happen to you, you'd file a claim, and then at some point in the future, there would be a payout or payback. In the, in the new modern world where we're building with this customer, we've got 50 other payers, providers that are then taking their records of what happened and how it happened. And they're sending it off into that central repository so that it can all be looked at by a one person at one time. So for example, we talk in cybersecurity all the time about two people trying to log in from two different places at the same time. Unpossible, right? Can't happen. So this is a lot the same thing. You can't have a knee replacement in Florida and California at the same exact time. But if you have to do that, if you put both of those claims in today, they will both be paid out and then we have to claw the money back. Why? Just use data sharing. When you see that transaction on the West Coast and you see it on the East Coast, we now know that it's not possible because it's in the same place we can tell that. We can't build patterns if we don't have the data. But what's really great about modern IT modernization and cloud technologies is that the same data that is then collated for fraud, waste, and abuse purposes can then be uh, sort of obfuscated and abstracted quite a bit, but then offered up in a single source of data to research institutions that want to understand sickness and endemic diseases in the United States. Snowflake was very successful doing this as part of the CDC's efforts with uh, COVID-19 in the state of California. Uh, we've also been very, very successful in uh, data sharing for research purposes related to COVID. So sort of all in one, it's the fraud, waste, and abuse, it's data collaboration, it's it's all of that great stuff all in one topic, Luke. Right, sort of pulling it all together and, and focusing on uh, sort of one system of record, really important, right, in, in regards to uh, systemic um, waste, fraud, and abuse, which is it's a big deal and every, every agency has that, right? I think uh, Nancy started the show and talked about that a little bit. We're going to take another short break and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. <laughs> 